Okay, let's get started. Welcome back. Uh, so uh, let's look at some of the examples. Uh, how we build the different examples using the index to APIs and the functionalities. So the first one is a examples. So use the high level and transfer learning API mentioned before you can actually customize a pre-trained model uh, to, for feature for, for feature extraction or fine tuning. So this uh, this shows the example of the, the dog versus cat. Uh, the, 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 use, <laughs> the, the simple example. So you can get the data from the uh, cargo website, and you download the data. You 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 put it in your local <coughs> disk drive. Now you can download the uh, pre-trained Inception V1 model from the uh, uh, NX Zoo, or you can download the pre-trained Cafe or TensorFlow Keras model. Uh, you, you can directly load that into the uh, NX Zoo. So this is a bunch of import. Uh, let's, let's look at the next one. Okay, in this case, uh, you basically initialize the uh, um, context. First, you initial um, context. And then you basically prepare the model, and the model path is passed to the pre-trained models, and the image path is passed to the uh, training images. So you have the model path and the image path, and then you can, as I mentioned before, you can directly read the images directly into the uh, data frames. Okay, once you load the data into the uh, data frames, you can you can perform various operations on on, on the data frame. In this case, uh, basically, uh, so this is a UDF to 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 generate the name of the of the of the image. So basically, you so, so basically you you get the file name and you 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 basic you put it into a get generate a name of the. Of the, of the figure, of the image, and then once you get the name, you can change the label. So if it's a, if the name contains a cat, it's, if the name contains a cat, so it's the label is one, and otherwise the name is, the label is two. So you can easily, so you, since you already have loaded data into a image, uh, image uh, into a data frame, here, image DF is the data frames, you can directly uh, add a column, name column using the UDF, and then you add another column, the label, using another UDF. So th this is basically the, the benefits of using data frames to, to, uh, and, and to build out the, uh, and training the pipeline because it makes it much easier to, to manipulate all the features, generate a different uh, field, and so on. When, when you do that, you can basically split the data and uh, here shows that what, how the data looks like. The name and the label. This is the name of the picture, this is the label of the picture, of course there is another column, the image which contains the pixel of the, of, of the image. After that, you can fine tune a pre-trained model. Uh, this is a, a list of pre-processing uh, steps we, we will construct, basically. So, so the image is essentially loaded as a pixel of the image, and then you will need to pre-process the, uh, the, the, the image using the built-in uh, processing operations inside analytic zoo. Here, here it looks like. We use the API to load a big DR model, and as I mentioned before, you can, you can, you can this is the inception view model, so this is the different layers inside that model. Uh, convolution. In this this is basically all the layers inside inside the inception model. So you basically we get a new model which uh, which use the pool five uh, slash job seven by seven as the new output model. So you uh, output a layer. So you get a new model. Essentially, you remove all the layers after this after this layer. You freeze the 
and then you freeze a couple of the first few layers. You, you basically freeze that so that it will not, not get changed or updated during the fine tuning. Then you add a few new layers. Uh, essentially, you 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 take the uh, output of the of the inception layer, and you you you, you generate a a a largest based on the features, and then now you can you can you can build a classifier, which you basically classify whether this image is a, is a cat or a dog. And then you, you build a classifier, and then you generate the ML pipeline. Finally, you, you just fit on the model, and you get a prediction result. So this shows the prediction result. Um, for this, this is the name of the, of, the, of the image, and this is a label, and this is a prediction. It's uh, pretty accurate. It's get about 19. I think it's, it's the test error is, is, is actually less than one percent, and uh, well, this shows uh, actually some of the sample images. You get some sample image and you predict this is, uh, well, this is a cat, and another cat. This is this is well, another cat, and this is a bunch of the, uh, dogs, and you get the prediction. The prediction label is two. Essentially, means it's it's a dog. So this is a very simple transfer learning uh, example. Basically, you can you just use uh, the APIs to load a pre-trained uh, and uh, load a pre-trained image classification model inside and use the Inception V1 model. And you can uh, remove a few layers, add a few layers, and uh, you fine tune on, on on your dog versus cat uh, exam uh, data. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So what are the uh, available parameters involved in the here, uh, the type of uh, optimizer, uh, learning rate, what are, what are available? Yeah, so there is a bunch of optimizers you can use, like, like uh, Adam, Adam, Adgrad, uh, uh, SGD, and so on. It's a bunch of, uh, let, 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 let me see if you hear it here. Yeah. In this example, basically, uh, it, it, it's a learning rate, uh, batch size, uh, epoch number, and uh, I think it's just use the default, uh, default, default uh, optimum message. And then you also have a various uh, scheduling, I mean, learning rate scheduling, how you, how, you, how you adjust to the learning rate, and so on. And uh, th this, is, uh, this, this one, you actually use the uh, ML pipeline interface. There, as I mentioned before, there we also support the Keras like uh, API, so that all those uh, um, parameters available in Keras, you can uh, al you, you can al always use that inside and all other Keras type APIs as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that transformer there, that's the that does the, the random augmentation. Yeah, yeah. The transformer is, is is the one we built up up here. Which does all those uh, transformations. Uh, you can you can build a random uh, random operation uh, transformer as well. I mean, if you just include there. Uh huh. And can you use methods from OpenCV? Uh, we ha actually have uh, exposed the OpenCV. Yeah, uh, you, you, there is uh, a few built-in operation we have built, and uh, you can also use OpenCV to build out the the the, the, the transformations if you want. You just de you define the function and include that in the transformer, or how does that work? Well, um, essentially. You, you basically you build a, this is a transformer, for instance, uh, resize. Inside, inside, actually, it's, it's actually use the OpenCV to, to, the, to do the processing. So you can build your own transformer if, if you want. And uh, inside your transformer, you can ju just directly use the OpenCV operations. We, we, we basically, we have included OpenCV on inside and then and you can just directly use that to build your own transformer. Okay. Uh, well, this is another simple example. Basically, it's use the uh, object detection API inside the NSU to, uh, um, to build a, basically to, to, to recognize the objects inside the video. We are using the, uh, a, the YouTube uh, uh, data set um, and the in particular, the, and uh, use the SSD uh, model, which internally uses the mobile net, 
and to the pre-trained SSD mobile net model, which is available at, uh, in NSS Zoo. So, well, it's a, in part a bunch of stuffs, uh, including a mo 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 movie pie uh, uh, library. So you download the model, and then you can essentially load the model from into your NXU, uh, into your NXU object detector. Uh, in this case, we are using a SSD mobile net uh, uh, pre-trained model, pre-trained on the Pascal VLC data. And then, this is the image we are we are going to process. It's a, as I mentioned before, it's a image. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a video. Not not an image. It's a video actually in the YouTube data set. And uh, we process that. Basically, we load the, the video, and then we essentially basically pre-process the video uh, into a, a sequence of frames, images. And this is this basically this is a, a clip, or the, the clips inside the inside the inside the, the the video. And then now you can use the, the Spark to parallel the processing of those images. Uh, in this case, we are doing a SD parallelize. Basically, we distributed the data across the cluster. Uh, but uh, because the data is not large, it's, it's, if the data is very large, it's possible is that the data is already stored on a distributed file system. You can directly use the Spark to load the distributed file into your into your uh, RDD, and then you, you construct an image set from distributed image set from the RDD. Now you, as, as, as I show in the in the in the in the slides earlier, you can just uh, use the object detector model. You just load it, the SSD mobile net model, and predict it on the image set, and then you use the visualize uh, to to basically visualize the image, uh, each of the image, and then you 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 must you, you basically take those images and you 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 write it back to a video file. So this is how it looks like. At the end of the day, and essentially, it, uh, what it does, it, it, you, you you load the pre-trained model from anything to the object detector model, and uh, you take the um, video, you transform video to, into a sequence of frames inside the video, and then you distribute those images across the cluster. So then you can, now you can use the um, object detection model the, to predict on those images, and, uh, and, and then use the utility to, to visualize the image by joining those uh, bounding boxes and, uh, and so on. And then you combine those images back to a, to a video. Yeah, this is uh, one more example of how you can directly use a um, TensorFlow pre-trained model. I mean, this is uh, we use a use a model from the TensorFlow Steam um, model library. Um, so this is this is basically the TensorFlow model, uh, the Steam model we, we are using. Um, now, uh, basically, this is. Using Slim model, this is the Inception model we have lo we, we downloaded from the TensorFlow Slim, and uh, you can basically uh, use use the Slim Slim code to basically reconstruct the model and uh, then restore the model. So basically, you 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 use the Slim code to to basically uh, reconstruct the Inception VM model, and then use the the the, the session saver to restore the model. So you, you now you have a TensorFlow model. And uh, the input is the image, and the output is, uh, I think, it, I believe, is the prediction. Oh, okay, it's the largest. So as I mentioned before, you can use the export utility, uh, export TF utility, uh, provided by analysis zoom. You just uh, export your TensorFlow model uh, with the input, with inputs are the images, and outputs are the largest, and then you can export the model to a to a folder. And then you can directly load it uh, into the analytics room, which means you can you now have a model you can directly run in Spark in parallel uh, across the cluster. So you, so we take one image, for instance, this this is the image from the MGNet uh, dataset. Uh, 
you, you can just basically take that model and you, you predict to do that. In this case, it's just one image, so it's, it's not, nothing fancy. It just tells you it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's one type of cat. But uh, uh, in reality, you can actually get, uh, you, you can basically direct a wrong distance from a model across the cluster in a distributed fashion because it's, it's now part of the, the NX zoo, a big deal model, so that you can directly uh, run it across the Spark tasks. And it's, you, you can also fine tune it, uh, I mean, you, you, you need also the Spark uh, support. Uh, yeah. So this is how, this, this is one demonstrate how you can actually directly load a model, in this case, a TensorFlow slim model, and uh, try to do a large scale distributed prediction. Yeah, it's actually, as I mentioned before, I mean, you can directly use the freeze the model if you know the input name and the output name, as, as, as shown here. Yeah, you can directly load a freeze from the model, so if you know the input name and output name. And there are some cases you actually do not, I mean, users do not know the input name. You typically know the output name, but you probably don't know the uh, input name. This is actually, here actually is the artificial example but demonstrated that. This one is from a train.batch. So this is basically your input. And uh, you, you, you really don't know the name because it's generated by uh, some low level libraries. Yeah, so, so, so it's provided, we, we provide utility for you to explore that, to directly use the, use the tensor instead of the name. But if you know the name, yeah, you just use the full, full, full model. Let's skip the test classification. Let's uh, skip the break. <laughs> okay. Let, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, how the distributed training is, is, is done in Big Deal. So Big Deal provides the data parallel training. So it's a data parallel, uh, it's data par parallel uh, every task uh, uh, processes a subset of a data, a partition of a data, and uh, uh, running the same model. Uh, it's a, it provides a synchronous mini batch SGD, uh, so it's a synchronous the uh, parameter synchronization, and uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the scaling and the convergence and the scheduling. So to recap, uh, th this is a Spark cluster, right? You have one single master, the driver node, and the many slaves, that's the worker nodes, and the Spark job uh, uh, essentially consists of many different tasks, and you dispatch the tasks to the workers to 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 to, to run those tasks. And uh, the Spark has a, a basically a Spark itself. Uh, the computer model in Spark is a data parallel. For, for secondary, it's uh, it use all those cost grained uh, functional operators. But it's so the RDD are immut immutable, so that uh, the, the transform the operator only transforms the RDD into a new RDD. And it's a functional cost grained operator, meaning that uh, the same operation will be applied to all the data items. So you so it's very different from uh, uh, it's actually somewhat very different from many existing data, um, deep learning frameworks in that uh, you will need the fine grained in data access with in place data up update so that you can get a good uh, performance uh, in terms of parameter updates and so on. But but those are not available in in those big data uh, systems because. Whether it's a Spark or MapReduce, so it's typically use this uh, functional cost grained uh, uh, computing model, data parallel model, because it makes it easier, first of all, to scale out to very large clusters, and secondly, it makes it easier to handle all those uh, fault tolerance uh, uh, resource uh, preemption and so on. So, so it's not, so, so it has a, actually has a very different uh, computing model. So let's see how we support those very efficient uh, distributed training using this computing model in Big DL. So as I mentioned before, uh, Big Deal uh, provides a data parallel synchronous uh, mini batch SGD. So you prepare your training data as a RDD of samples, which which essentially uh, consisting a input feature and a label, and you construct the RDD of models. So you have a model, and then we will replicate the model for each task. We will have a basically a, a replicate of the model. So you, you will get an RDD of models. So uh, the training is, is an iter iterative process, as I mentioned before. Uh, in each iteration, we will run two Spark jobs. The, 
the first one will essentially uh, basically computes the gradients. It runs the forward and backward on the model, uh, compute gradient in parallel. And the second, the second job will, will perform the parameter synchronization. It will aggregate all the gradients and update the weights uh, as, uh, based on the specified uh, optim optimi optimization methods, the learning rates, and so on. So let's look at the first job. The, the first job, as I mentioned before, the first job uh, essentially it, with what is the data parallel training? So the first job does the model for the backward. So as I mentioned before, we have a first a, a sample RDD, which is your training data. Each sample consists of a, a input feature and then label. I, we have a large uh, set of training data and we will partition it into many different partitions. So we have a sample RDD and uh, uh, we have each, inside the sample RDD we have many partition of the training samples and each partition uh, is, let's say, it's, uh, it, it, it's located on a different worker. And the second, as I mentioned, we have a model RDD. The model RDD is essentially a collection of models. So, uh, so in the model RDD, it also have uh, many different uh, partitions. And inside each partition, there is one model replica, which essentially is a replication of the, of, of the model, the model you specified. And the, Mod, the sample RDD is the training data, and the model RDD is the model replica is co-partition and co-located. So, so that uh, on work one, you have partition one of the sample RDD and the partition one of the model RDD. So you have a local partition of the training data and a local model. So, so on work two, you have, you, you have uh, similar, you have partition two and so on. So inside the, the, this job, it runs many tasks, each task will get those two partitions, the local data partition, local sample partition, and the local model partition, and then it will basically compute the gradients. Basically, it will run the model forward and the backward on those subset of data. Of course, it's, it's a batch of the data. You sample some data from those local partition, and then you run the model forward and backward. So, so essentially, you have many tasks running in parallel. Each task uh, computes a local gradient uh, using the local model and the local data. As I mentioned before, it's a data parallel training, so all the data are different, but the model is exactly the same, so it has exactly the same weight. But it will compute a different uh, gradient because it uses different uh, data to compute the gradient. So this is the uh, first uh, job, which does the model forward and backward, which computes all the, all the lo local gradients on, on each node. The second step, as I mentioned before, it runs a parameter synchronization job. So uh, in the first, uh, uh, after the first job, it's, uh, on each node, you compute a local gradient. So each node, has, each, 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 node uh, ha, uh, each worker has a local gradient, and we will divide the local gradient into n partitions. So each local gradient is divided into n partitions. And uh, each task, inside the parameter synchronization is responsible for aggregate one partition from the local gradient. So task one will get the first partition from all the local gradients. Task two will get the gradient from all, the second partition of the gradient from all the lo local gradients. So it's essentially, it's, it's, if you are familiar with the <coughs> MapReduce, it's a kind of like a shuffle. So each task computes its own local gradient in the, in the, in the pre previous in the previous job. Each task computes its own local gradient, and we will shuffle, and it will divide the local gradient into n partitions or n splits, and then we shuffle the same partition into the in, into the same task. So it will get all those. So task one get all those uh, blue box sum it, aggregate it, basically add them together, and then update the, okay, in this case, partition one of the weight. So all the weight, again, are partitioned into n partitions. So task one will only update the partition one of the weights uh, based on the yeah, 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 optimizing me method. And the task two will partition the second, uh, second part of the weight, and so on. So this is the parameter synchronization pattern. You get the, uh, you aggregate every, every task, kind of, every task is kind of like a parameter server. 
it's, it's not exactly a parameter, but it's kind of like a parameter. So every task is responsible for one partition of the gradient, aggregate the, that gradient, and update that partition of the weight, the corresponding partition of the weight. So you, you so it's essentially in the second job, you shuffle the nth partition of all gradients to this task, you aggregate or sum the gradients, you update the, this nth partition of the weight. Now you have the, now task n has the latest uh, weight for the nth partition. What it does is it broadcasts, just broadcasts the, this, this nth partition of the weight to every other workers. So, so, so basically you, you just broadcast the, 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 the updates away to every other worker. So in the next iteration, at the beginning of the next iteration, you will be able to read the latest weight because uh, uh, the, 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 this job in the last uh, uh, iteration will broadcast the updated weight to every other worker. So the, the, the model for the what the job in the next iteration will read the latest weight from 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 other 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 work, workers. So you can now you get the latest weight and you can you can you, you can you can repeat this process. So if if you are familiar with uh, Spark, you can see this is a parameter server type of architecture, but it's uh, implemented directly on top of the primitives that are available in Spark. So the, grad the, the gradient uh, aggregation, as I mentioned before, it's just like a shuffle. You basically, just like shuffle, you, 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 -partition, you partition the, the, the gradient and you shuffle the partition I to the task I of the, of the next job. The weight synchronization is a broadcast, but it's, in, it's a task side broadcast. Typically, uh, when we do broadcast in, in big data systems, you basically broadcast a data, a common data, a read-only data from your driver node to every other worker. For instance, if you have a word embedding, for instance, you have a word embedding, you can just broadcast the word embedding to every other worker so that uh, every task can, can just uh, read the word embedding. But in this case, it's a task side broadcast. Every task will broadcast its own partition of the updated weight to every other task, every other worker. And uh, it's used in memory persistence in memory cache inside the Spark. So all those gradients and the weight are cached in memory. So that it, 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 basically it's, 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 it's not, it's, it's cached in memory so that uh, every other worker can read it very, with very low latency. So this is, uh, this is when we, uh, we work with the Cray, the supercomputer company who actually have already integrated Big DL into their uh, product and this product and they run some uh, large scale testing uh, up to 250 nodes. Uh, this is, I think, I believe this is the Inception V1 training on ImageNet data. And as you can see, it's, uh, it scales almost linearly until 128 nodes. After that, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's slowed down a little bit, but it still scales reasonably until 256 nodes. So. So this 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 uh, um, parameter style uh, parameter server style all thing, uh, all reduce type of operations implemented on directly on top of big big data operations is actually very efficient even though we do not have all those fine graded access in place updates because in in, in Spark, all the RDDs are immutable and all the operations are cost grade. We are still able to implement those uh, highly efficient uh, parameter synchronizations using those primitives, which provides a, f a, a very good uh, scale out, uh, um, basically scale out characteristics of big data training. Uh, one caveat is that, I mean, when you do a scale out distributed synchronous mini batch SGD training, you actually increase the mini batch size quite a bit. So the total now the total batch size is actually the patch size per worker uh, times the number of workers you have in your cluster. And uh, as we know that if you increase the, the, the size of, of the mini batch size, you can you, you, you can you can lead, you see, there can be a loss in your test accuracy. And there's some some of the um, efforts. Uh, in the industry and uh, in the universities, which try to uh, 
basically use various strategies, including linear scaling rules, the warm-up strategies, layer-wise adaptive scaling, adding no batch normalization, and so on. So, so there's a bunch of strategies. Um, you can refer to those two papers for more detail, but there are a bunch of strategies helps you to basically still convert you to a reasonable accuracy, uh, even with a larger batch size. So we have tried that uh, as well. So this is uh, uh, Inception V1 test result where um, using patch size up to 8K. As you can see that, uh, well, with, with those warm up, linear scaling, gradient clipping, basically we add the gradient clipping um, strategies to, 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 to that. And uh, with and, uh, a few more <laughs> epochs you are training, you can actually still achieve uh, comparable uh, accuracy with top one, top five. Uh, of course, uh, in, for inception v1 there are no batch normalization uh, layers. Uh, we, we are thinking about it, maybe you can add adding some batch normalization layer to the inception v1, which can further help the, uh, the, the convergence. This is the SSD. Uh, we are training on um, 200, up to 200 uh, uh, images per batch. And uh, you do this as a well, uh, your strategy, your those strategies were still able to get a reasonable uh, mean average precision, of, even when we have the very large batch, si batch size compared to I mean uh, when you're running uh, uh, on a single node. So, so it's so it's, which means it's actually possible to scale out to, to a larger uh, cluster when when you do the distributed training, uh, either in terms of throughput uh, and as well as the convergence. So let's let's look at let, let, let's recap what we have done. I mean, in a classic uh, uh, parameter server architecture uh, implemented in say TensorFlow, MXNet, and so on, it actually has a different architecture versus what we have in BigDL. Right? In a classic parameter server architecture, you typically have many long-running potential states for tasks. So typically, you have uh, in TensorFlow's case, you have workers and the PS, and which essentially are long-running long -running processes and the Many uh, many of them are stateful, and they interact with each other. Typically, in a block fashion, if you want to do synchronous uh, um, parameter synchronizations, and uh, yeah, so you typically you use fine fine grained data access and in place uh, data 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 update, and those are not available on those existing big data systems because those big data, I mean Spark, Hadoop. Uh, so the systems that really run, uh, provides a cost grain data parallel functional API. So what we do is we actually run a series of sh very short-lived Spark jobs. So we e e each mini batch, each iteration, we actually run two jobs. So each job is like, very, very, very short. It's typically a, a couple of seconds. And each 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 task in the job is stateless and non-blocking. So uh, if you if you look at uh, uh, if you look at those uh, pseudo, pseudo code, you can see it's actually stateless and non-blocking, which means you can fail. Each task can fail. It will not block other tasks, and you just rerun the task. I mean, inside in in, in big data system, if a task fails, it's just uh, get a rerun. So it's just you just rerun it. It's it's, it's non-blocking, stateless. It's, you can just rerun the task until it's success, it's, until it succeed. And the, the the benefit of that is, is it's, which makes it possible to actually to, to do the dynamic resource sharing. So because, because when, 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 when you have more resources, uh, you get killed because, uh, because of preemption and so on, or because of failures, you, you can adapt to that uh, resource change very, free, very rapidly because, because each job is very short, each task is very short and it's uh, stateless and it's non-blocking, you can just uh, rerun the task. However, there is a caveat, which means you need to schedule a lot more tasks than you than you, than you will do if you have a very long have a long running task, right? So if you if for instance, if you're running on two hundred fifty six node, and each task runs for two seconds, you need you need to schedule hundreds of tasks per per second, and if you have even more node, so as you can see. Uh, actually, hundred node, uh, hundred node uh, uh, range is okay. The, 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 the 
scheduling overhead is about 6%. But if you have 500 nodes, 500 tasks, the scheduling overhead can go, to, go up to 10% 10, 10 of, the, of the total compute time, which is, a, which is quite, quite a lot. So what, what, you, what we have done in Big Data is that, first of all, we run a single, basically on each work, we'll just run one task. Inside that task, we will, the task will much spread itself. So we, we will actually reduce the number of tasks that exist in, in the system because we will run a single task per, no, per worker. And the, the task will multistrate by itself. So, so basically, it helps us to achieve high scalability with, with, with 100 to 200 nodes. And the two, to scale to an even larger worker, as I, as I mentioned before, if you, you go to 500 nodes, you, you, the overhead can be quite a bit. What we could do, and we have been working on it, essentially we, we, are, we can leverage the, the iterative model training. Basically, in each iteration, we're, we're basically running the same operation. You just uh, compute the gradient, aggregate the gradients, update the weight. So it's, it's essentially the same operation. It's just run a different set of data. So you can leverage the iterative nature of the, of the model training. And one example is uh, we can leverage Drizzle, which, which is a low latency execution engine uh, from, for Spark. It's, it's a research project from UC Berkeley. And we work with them to basically, think, uh, in Drizzle, you can actually schedule a group of tasks. In this case, you can, you, you can schedule multiple iterations of the, of the training all at once. So this is an example here. The, as the number of tasks uh, improve, increase, you, you can see the increase of the uh, scheduling overhead. Uh, so it's OK for one maybe 100, 200 nodes is, is probably okay, but if you have a lot of nodes, 400, 600 nodes, it's quite a lot. And, but with the drizzle, you can actually re you can greatly reduce the overhead because it, it's just basically, it can, instead of scheduling one task at a time, it can schedule a group of tasks all at once because it's, uh, all the tasks are all the same. So they are basically the same computation. It's just, uh, it's run again and again, again on a different set of data. So this is essentially how the uh, how the distributed training uh, is implemented uh, in in Big DL, which provides a basically very very, very highly scalable distributed uh, training using the data parallel and synchronous mid batch SGD uh, mechanism. Yes. Yeah. Now, is that on? Uh, there was some examples that mentioned uh, CPU. Is that does this work for GPU parallelization as well? Um. Basically, it's it. So, 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 so aggregate itself is orthogonal, right? I mean, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. I, I think the, the only only difference here is that it's uh, runs using the Spark uh, framework. So inside the Spark framework, there is all the primitive, the like uh, in-memory caching, shuffle, and so on. It's, it goes through all those network stack and the uh, JVM memory caching and so on. So it's uh, it's it will be more efficient to running on CPU. Going going through the stack. Um, we, well, it, of course, there is a question, uh, I mean, there are two, let, let's put it this way, there are two actually uh, overheads uh, when we do the distributed training. One is the bandwidth, the other one is the latency. So for a lot of the models, for most of the models, the latency is, uh, is a limiting fact, not a bandwidth. But uh, for some of the very large models, I could imagine that you, so, so, you, you can become, so, so bandwidth can become a bottleneck. As you can see here, I mean, basically everyone is doing the communication. So you basically get the model from, uh, basically you get a, a, a block of the model. So every, everyone will get the same, same size of the model. So basically the, the block of the model times the end of the task. So as the size of the model increases, uh, you, you will get a, the, the bandwidth become a bottleneck. But for most of the, of the model we're working with, the bandwidth is not a bottleneck. And what size uh, data sets is it appropriate to uh, possibly use this as opposed to training with a single GPU or what would you recommend? 
Well, uh, there are two parts of the to the to your to your to your, to your question. First of all, of course, the data set. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned before, we have been working with a lot of customers with. Uh, I think in one particular case, we are uh, basically working with, uh, uh, I think one example is the World Bank, who, who have uh, several million of images, and it's uh, we, we run it on, I think, tens of nodes, which make it uh, uh, very efficient. I think that's the sense one, one gives you the idea of the number of, uh, for instance, images. But the other part is really, I mean, how integrated the, 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 the data is with, with your big data system. That's another getting fact because in a lot of cases you need to process your data, pre-process the data on, on, on Spark for instance and then copy the data over then it, it, it's not very efficient to do that. Yeah. But if you have very clean data which are already cleaned, yeah, you can put it on a single node and you can, you can just process it. Uh, yeah, we will probably just look very briefly into this one. Uh, I think this one, this one is actually similar to um, previous example. It's just that it's it's it's, it's using more complex models. It's basically it shows you how to build a uh, variation auto encoder. Uh, uh, yeah. I think I think people are probably familiar with that. Basically, this is the, the auto encoder. You you basically encode the image into a latent vector and uh, decode that to generate a, a new image. And uh, the variation auto encoder puts a constraint in that the latent um, vector will, will will follow the unit Gaussian distribution, so it will generate a two vector. One is the mean, the other one is the variance uh, vector. One is the mean vector, and uh, and to, to use the uh, it's use the KL divergence uh, <coughs> as one well, as part of the cost. <coughs> so this is how, how it is. How, this is how it is done. It's uh, well, this is uh, the image we have and so on. And uh, okay, this is the encoder. How the encoding is implemented? As you can see, it's uh, it's, it's basically for uh, it is the same as the Keras API. So it uses the same Keras API to, to construct a, a, a simple convolution model, CN, and uh, for the encoder, to, so it generates uh, two outputs. One is the mean vector, the other one is the uh, variance vector, log variance vector. And then the other one is the decoder, uh, which takes uh, which, which take a, a latent uh, vector and uh, generate to, to to perform the kind of a deconvolution to generate the, the the output. So this is how the autoencoder is, is implemented. So you you have the basically you, you basically have the encoder. The encoder has uh, to generate a mean and the various vector, and you sample that to get a Gaussian and sample, and then you input this uh, into the decoder and generate one. So this is exactly how you would uh, you would do <laughs> in a a Keras uh, implementation. It's uh, so it provides the same Keras API you can use and uh, and then this this one is uh, this one is not 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 that uh, unusual. It's basically the like MNIST data set and you can you can get and. Uh, The training object, as I mentioned before, it's it's, it's basically a, a care that 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 criteria plus a BC card criteria. And uh, well, I think it's it's pretty straightforward. You you get the auto encoder and oh here here we here is the the part we provide uh, and this will provide a native integration with TensorBot. So you can basically uh, set the tensor border um, and log, 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 log directory so that it will generate a result in the directory and then you can open tensor border directory to look at the uh, other, other training statistics and so on. 
this, this makes it easier for, for people to actually use uh, those ending string and big deal on top of Spark. So you do a fetch and, uh, well, that's, that's basically what it is. It's a, uh, you can generate the amnesty result. So this, this is a very, it's kind of a simple example. And this one, oops, let's put this one. This one is a little bit different in that it uses a somewhat more complex model. As you can see here, it's, it's actually uses a uh, somewhat more complex CNN model to, to basically to generate uh, faces. I believe it's generate faces for the for using a uh, variation auto encoder. So it's essentially a this is a uh, CN plus batch normalization plus uh, Likia, Lalu, and so on. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's, I think we can skip this one. This, this essentially is the same. Same architecture you get the encoder is is that it's use a more comp, uh, compressed model, and you get the same thing the decoder, and uh, you can train the model. You load the dataset. In this case, we're using the selected uh, dataset, and uh, compile the model, set a tensor bar, and uh, you can you can show the yeah you can show the sample of the dataset. It's uh, essentially. Okay, let's, I think, let's, yeah, let's, let's go to this one. As I mentioned before, uh, we have been working with a lot of uh, real-world users and customers to build out their applications. And we, we will talk some of examples here. I mean, uh, well, uh, there, there are several, several reasons they are running that, uh, run, running, running the, so the deep learning applications on, on top of Spark and on top of the analytics room. Big deal. Uh, one 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 fact is, of course, they have a large data set they need to process. Secondary, they have actually very complex data processing pipelines. Uh, in, uh, the data size may be okay, but uh, you, you re in real world there are a lot of um, complications on how you can process the data and uh, and so on. and uh, and certainly, of course, a lot of their infrastructures, uh, uh, especially production infrastructures, they build around Hadoop and Spark, and it's much easier to integrate uh, the deep learning functionality into their production environment instead of, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, set, uh, copy the data between different infrastructures. Yeah, let's look at one example. JD.com. I just mentioned that. I mean. Uh, this is an example they have. What they, basically, what they try to do is they get all those images, 100 million images, and they try to recognize uh, what is in that image, and then they extract features from that uh, object, and those can be used for various applications. Uh, yeah, some applications, uh, similar image search. Basically, it's, a, it's an online website. It, it's a online shopping website. So one of the features is that you can basically take a picture using a camera, upload that picture to their website, and they can return a list of similar items so you can buy. And there are also uh, competitive, competitive price monitoring. Um, I'm not sure, if, uh, I mean, you, I think in the US you have you know, it's, uh, Black Friday and so on, and in China you have single day, Singles Day. Uh, it's, 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 it's basically a, a very, unlike, very large online campaign, and they try to monitor their price versus their competitor, competitor's price, and they're using different uh, ways to compare whether those are the same, same, same items. So they so can use images to do that. So this is one example you can, you can do a search. You can input this one, and you get a bunch of <laughs> pictures, you, items you can buy from their website. So um, in this case, actually, it's not, as I mentioned before, they are, they are basically using those um, uh, SSD models and the deep bit models, which they, they actually kind of already developed uh, using Cafe on a GPU uh, node. And then, try, then the, the, what they try to do is try to product, productionizing their the solution uh, on their hundreds of millions of images. And they, have, they previously tried to run it on a cluster of GPU servers. They actually tried to, to do that. And then it's, it's become a very uh, complex and challenging for them to do that. There are several reasons. 
uh, first of all, they need to, I mean, because, because they have a lot of images, hundreds of millions of images, they really need to do it in distributed fashion. And uh, it's very difficult to actually, very complex, very error prone, if you want to manually manage those uh, distributed systems. How do you do a resource management? How do you do a resource allocation? How do you partition data? How do you do the load balance? Uh, for tolerance, model deployment, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's become very difficult for them to do that. And uh, second, actually, it, it, it's, pro, it's, 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 it's uh, end to end performance is lower if, if you're using GPU. Because if you look at the whole pipeline, you need to first read the data from the edge, edge base. So you need to process those images um, in a distributed fashion. Then you run the model. And then you, you do that again, and then you need to write the data back to a distributed file system. So the end-to-end -end performance is actually pretty low. Uh, if you, re for instance, reading the image out can take half of their processing time. And uh, of course, uh, it's, it's very inefficient, or very, very complex if they want to do image pre-processing. They, they need to do those image pre-processing, and they need to do it on top of H base. It's, uh, it's not easy to do that without a big data uh, framework to help them to do that. So at the end of the day, they, they, they actually switch their deployment to, to the Analytic Zoom using Spark and Big DL. So, so essentially, they use the basically we load the cafe model directly into a, a Spark using Big Deal, and they, they read the image out of the base uh, uh, using a large Spark job. You process those images, and then you you just use the loaded cafe model to basically you load the cafe model into Big Deal, and then you can directly run inside your Spark jobs and to 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 to, to do the. Well, to do the recognition, and then you again you crop, you process again you process the image to crop and other stuff uh, using Spark and OpenCV, and finally you run another job, another uh, cafe, another model you load it into uh, Big DL, and then you store the data on HDFS. So you see, so just a re run, reuse their existing Hadoop and Spark clusters to do those uh, deep learning, and the, it actually give about uh, four. 4x actually, I think it's uh, about four to six x the speed up if you if you look at the end to end the pipeline from the data ingestion to pre processing model inferences and the data uh, without uh, uh, storage. It actually gives you uh, four to six the speed up if you look at the end to end pipeline running on Spark and Big Deal. I think this one compares. Uh, yeah, I think this one compares twenty k forty cars. And this one is, uh, I think, 120 in Xi'an code uh, to translate to about 24 Xi'an servers. Yeah, about 24 Xi'an servers. And uh, this is a throughput. And uh, you can see the highest bit. Well, this is another example. Uh, uh, we actually have been working with MS listings, uh, which is a real uh, estate uh, what kind of real estate service provider? Uh, and uh, what they try to do essentially is they want to uh, they want to use image similarity to recommend the house to 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 to, to the buyers. So essentially, when you are browsing those uh, this 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 fig on their website, you are buying this house. They will auto populate these similar houses, which are generated by the model, which uh, essentially. It's based on, of course, based on a lot of factors, uh, including the location of the house, the, the price of the house, uh, and so on. But also based on the visual similarity, how similar those house looks like. So it's uh, it's run on Azure. Uh, you get the data actually stored in the Azure storage, and then you use the so 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 stack to to generate uh, uh, the the similarity without uh, putting into a table. It could be edge base or other. And other table, and then you run a web service, web application, which which queries the uh, table and the two generator result. So, under the hook, it actually runs uh, user transfer learning and uh, to do to do this stuff. Basically, it takes the uh, pre-trained model on the place data, the the places data, and use the use the pre-trained model. I believe this is uh, this is the inception inception uh, model. Pre Trained on our uh, inception V1 model, trained on the place data. So you get the, a, a RDD of the your house images. You basically process those images and uh, you use the, 
is the pre-trained model to train three new classifiers. The first one is, uh, uh, is, is, a, is this picture uh, front of the house. And the second one is that is this picture, what the style of the house, whether it's modern or it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> metro and so on. And the third one is how many floors this house had. So this basically it, 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 it trains three classifiers. And then it uses the VGG, another pre-trained model, the VGG model pre-trained on those uh, pre-state and extract features. And then combines those uh, tags of, of generated by those classified and the features, so it generates a embedding for those uh, house, and then it can uh, use that embedding to, uh, to, 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 to compute the similarity, compute the, basically compute the, the similar, cosine, cosine similarity of the house. So let, let's look at some of the um, example code we have. Um, well, basically, as I mentioned before, this is, <coughs> they basically use the similarity of the of the figures, there are two types of similarity we 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 look at. One is the semantic similarity, right? I mean, whether this is a bedroom and this is a um, di dining room. So, if if they are different, so they are, they are different. If even if they don't, if they are both a bedroom, they are similar, even if they look different. And also, there are visual similarities in that if they look similar. And uh, as I mentioned before, basically we. We try to, for each image, we basically compute a categorical score, whether this is a bedroom or it's a uh, living room, kitchen, or it's an exterior. How, and then it's, it's a, what's the style, right? It's, it's, it's the style, the, and then the visual similarity. So basically, based on some uh, some some features it's generated, and then use those uh, scores, the class score, the tax score, and the visual score to compute the final score. How similar those houses are. So let's look at that. So this is, this is essentially initialize the uh, uh, n contest, and then you. This, this is similar. We, this is basically we get a bunch of uh, data from those uh, uh, press. Place is data set, and the again you read you read the data and you generate the label, and then you train the data. Basically, you run the split net and then train the data. It's a, you can sh you can see whether this is a, a bedroom, so whether this is a bathroom or it's a bedroom, it's a house or, or others. So you basically generate the label based on the based on the the the, 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 the file name. You download it from the place place data set. Then we will load the pre-trained cafe model. Uh, this is, is the Inception V1 model, and you remove uh, again you remove the layers after after some 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 other some layers. And optionally you can freeze the layers, but we're not not doing that in this demo. So you build a network by adding those uh, pre-trained model as well as a few new layers after the pre-trained model, and then you, you this is the pre-processing you will uh, basically perform on those input data set, and then doing classifier which essentially trains whether the, the this picture is a bedroom or a, a a front of the house. So you have a classifier. Now you have a, now you have a classifier to. To classify whether the, this picture is a is a bedroom or not, or is the front of the house or not. Well, this is accuracy. It's uh, as you can see, it's it's, it's pre pretty. You, you can pretty easily get a higher accuracy using the transfer learning. Then the visual similarity. Basically, we we prepare a a, a triplet of the data, the uh, the query image. And then one positive image and the one negative image basically shows whether 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 those images are similar or not. So there is different ways you can do that, and uh, uh, we evaluate different approaches. And eventually, what we try, what we do is essentially we take the uh, pre-trained model, and then we generate the uh, features, and then we use a, a cosine similarity to to compute. The similarity, similarity scores, and 
if it turns out the VGG model has actually pretty good uh, result in terms of uh, uh, using its feature to compute the similarity score. So we, so again, we 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 load a pre-trained VGG model on uh, a pre-trained the VGG model on the place data, and uh, we compute the. Yeah, we generate a new model. Again, we use the transfer learning API to generate a new model, and uh, then we compute the we compute the embed basically compute the embedding. It's 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 now as you can see it's it's actually loaded as a transformer inside the ML pipeline so that you can just transform on your on your data set to generate the embedding. So this is this is basically what it looks like. For each image you generate an embedding. This is the L to normalize the embedding. So we this is how the model looks like. You basically you load the load the model and you generate a, a new model by removing the layers after proof five and you add the L2 normalize yeah I, yeah, you add a norm to normalization uh, to the model, and you, you then you use the model to generate the embedding. Now, what 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 we do is essentially this shows the, we we get a set of images, and then we try to use those uh, uh, basically the C model, which essentially compute the tag of the of the image, right? Whether it's a, a front of the house or not, uh, and then we use the embedding uh, model to generate the uh, embedding using the fe feature uh, to normalize the feature of the of the image, and then, then we save the save that uh, uh, data in a table. Now we can what we can do is that we pick a random house from the data set as our query image. So this this is the house we use. And uh, we can use, and then we compute the score. Basically, the how the how similar this house is to every house we just computed. So basically, you you use a, a class score, and uh, basically, if it's uh, same class, it's zero. It's one. Otherwise, it's uh, it's zero. And then the visual score, which essentially is the, is the constant similarity between those uh, two features, and we compute the how similar those two houses are using this score, and then we print out the top three similar. So this is the, our query image, and the top three similar image uh, uh, looks like this. So this this shows you actually how we use the uh, uh, similar, you, you, you use those uh, pre-trained models to perform transfer learning and to compute the similarity. So at the end of the day, we, we can we can show the customer this type of uh, recommendations, uh, basic based on the how similar this looks like. Another example is essentially uh, we have been working with the World Bank, try to uh, basically this is the transfer learning based image classification. Uh, what 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 the what the World Bank is trying to do here is that basically World Bank is doing a lot of uh, price surveys around the world. So how expensive some some food or some some goods is I mean around the world. So they are trying to do some cross source source cross source uh, price data collection. So people have their phones and they can take a picture and then they can upload to, to, to World Bank. And the, the, the issue is that they actually, so here comes the, the, the tricky part. It's really not a, a, a dog versus, a cat versus dog problem or image problem because the picture is very, very messy. They have people using different uh, phones. Some are f just the feature phones, some are very high resolution phones. Uh, they have uh, they have uh, some pictures have a lot of blurs and uh, some pictures have many. If you look at this picture carefully, it actually has many different uh, uh, different type of food inside the picture, and uh, so on and so forth. So what they do is really we really need, first we need to do a lot of pre-processing on the images to emulate all those poor quality images. Some images are just invalid. You you cannot even resize the image and so on and so forth, and then. 
you cast an image by the full type, try to validate uh, your existing labels, and then generate the label. So I think half of them, they have totally sh about three images. Half of the probably one third of them have labels, and the other have no labels. They really they want to build a class so that they can build a classification model to, to label those images. And then they, they would like to release those images to the public. But the problem is that some of the images have personal identifier information. You, you may have some confidential information that related to people's identity. So you really need to recognize those uh, um, uh, information and blur that before they can release the images to the public. So we have been working uh, with, with them to actually work on the phase one of the project. And uh, so not sure if we can see that clearly, but it's, it's a sim very similar to what we have been um, talking about. Basically, you use, uh, you load a, yeah, you, in this case, you load an Inception V1 model uh, from the analytic zoom, model zoom. You can uh, do some, well, you're doing transfer learning to, to generate a new model to do the classifier. And you're using the own frame to do to, to basically to classify to train the model using the transfer learning and uh, finally you, you you basically predict the model using the transformer in ML pipeline. So this is a result. Basically, we're running on uh, about one million images with labels and the train it on twenty I think it's twenty AWS instances. And this this is basically the the result they get. I get about uh, something like eighty percent accuracy uh, using the transfer learning, uh, using the pre-trained inception model models. Uh, a lot of images. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. And one question: How to remove the poor quality images? Well, there is actually. Um, there's different type of different type of <laughs> full quality images. Some, uh, I think, what we have been working on is some uh, images are not uh, when you try to do um, are not invalid. So first of all, there are a lot of images that are invalid. For instance, when you try to do a resize or uh, normalization of the images, it just gives you uh, error. I mean, so the so OpenCV library just gives you error. So you, you, you we, we, we build the pipeline actually to, to, to filter out those images uh, during the training. And then there are some images that had uh, different resolutions and so on, so we, 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 we could, uh, could filter that, that as well. Um, the, the other part uh, is uh, for some images, it's not very, you see some blurs or some, some of them has uh, um, conflicting, <laughs> conflicting uh, class categories and so on. That's one of the reasons it's, it's, it's only getting about 80% accuracy because of those stuff. And uh, we, we're still working on that part. Okay, quick, I only, yeah. Yeah, phase two, what we try to do, as I mentioned before, phase two is something we will try to do next. We're in the, yeah, we, we basically pre-processing those uh, images, uh, detect the text and uh, the bounding box. And then we try to recognize the text to see if it contains the personal identifiable information and blur the text. And this is something we, 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 we try to do in the next step. Well, well this is really not a <laughs> computer vision problem, but just nevertheless, it's actually demonstrate how people are using that for different, uh, different problems. This is actually for a uh, payment transaction uh, fraud detection problem. Unipay is a uh, well, it's probably the largest payment organization in the world. It's 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 it's, it's, it's from China. It's uh, like a Visa or Mastercard. Uh, it, it processes a lot of those transactions and they try to do the fraud detection. So in this case, they actually have built their entire data infrastructure around the Cloudera distributions. So basically they are storing all the data in their CDH cluster. So data is stored in a hive table and uh, so you, you need to process the data, uh, you basically pre-process the data, all the, basically it's a tra all the transaction logs they have. So you need to pre-process the data and you need to uh, build a Spark pipeline to do, to do that. Oops. What's going on here? 
I believe I need, I probably need to plug in my power. So the data, as I mentioned before, the data is essentially the transaction log. It's stored in a, a Hive table. And the, what, what we do is essentially, uh, as you can see, the, the, uh, as you can imagine, the fraud transaction is only a very tiny portion of, 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 the, of the other, other data. So what we do is essentially, we, we actually uh, sample the data so that uh, we, we downsample the uh, non fraud the transaction and upsample the fraud transaction. And then we build an ensemble of models. We to, to, to efficiently use the data, we actually build many, many models which, sample, which, which have a different sample, the sample data. And we build, a, a, I think, 10 plus models. And uh, to build an ensemble of the models and, uh, and, and, and basically uh, to, to, to generate the result. Sorry, this one is actually implemented in, in Scala, not Python. So, <laughs> so but uh, anyway, it gives you the, the idea how to implement it. So uh, we're, we're actually using a public data set to demonstrate the fraud detection uh, and stuff. It's essentially the uh, so it has uh, it's, 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 so it's the public data set. So it has a lot. It has twenty eight. I believe it has twenty eight fields, but it's all anonymized and, uh, and field. So you can see it's only have a. So it's, it's, it's a field is v one, v two, and so on. It's, it has a time and amount. So that are two two fields which gives you some some idea of how it um, is. But all the other fields are, are, are normalized. So, as you can see, it, it, so, so it has some field and it has time amount and the class whether it's a, class one means it's a fraud, class zero means it's not a fraud. So we, we are bu building a we are, we use a Spark data frame. It's actually easier f for us to build a pipeline for the feature transformations. So we, we just define a, a UDF and then we use that UDF to process the uh, data frame to 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 generate a feature. As you can see here, this is a feature transformation. Essentially, you if uh, let's let's look at this one. It's, it's, this one actually assembles all those uh, twenty-eight features that are available in in that uh, uh, record and assemble that into a vector. So this is a bunch of data frame prep, data frame operations that you can essentially to uh, process a feature, and then you can. Yeah, this is a generated feature, as you can see. This is, we basically com combine those uh, features into a vector <coughs> and, uh, and, and all those, uh, other, so those are the other flawed features, flawed records. Now we 
we split the data, and uh, we are not doing using a random split here because, uh, each, as, as, as I mentioned before, each, each record has a time field. So what in, in reality, essentially, people are using history data to predict for future uh, record, right? You use history data to predict whether a future transaction is a fraud or not. So basically, we are split based on the time. So essentially, we, we use the time. Uh, basically, we we we, we split based on the time. So all the, all the data will become our training data, and the new record will become our validation data. Uh, in this case, we are using a very simple uh, perception, uh, very simple material perception to as our model, uh, but to, and, and then we put it, I mean, we put an N classifier to build the model, and then we can fit on that. So this is evaluation evaluation uh, method, right? You you just take the you just take the transformer, you transform the data, and then you you, you use the uh, yeah, and then we compute the matrix, so uh, including uh, area <coughs> excuse me area and the precision recall curve, the so recall and the precision. This is a result. Uh, as you can see, that this one is pretty low because uh, because because there is uh, the data is very imbalanced. Imbalanced because uh, there is I think less than one percent is a fraud data. So we, so this this area under the precision recall curve is critical actually, uh, in, in, rather than those two num so those two those two metrics. So what we do, as I mentioned before, we, we what we try to do here now is we will first of all sample the data, we will downsample the uh, we will downsample the normal data and uh, upsample the fraud data, and then and then next we build a ensemble of we in this case we build ten models we build an ensemble of models each on a different. Uh, Sample the data result, and uh, yeah, this is the training pipeline. So we can e easily build a, a training pipeline to 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 train many different uh, uh, models, and those 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 can potentially, in this case, it's not, but potentially you can actually run them in parallel. Now you can see uh, we can improve the. Uh, Error and the and precision recall curve to about ninety percent, which is, which is which is okay <laughs> for for this use case. So you, yeah, we we use the error and the, the precision recall curve from fifty five zero point fifty five, yeah, fifty to ninety, about ninety. Yeah, I think. I think the point here is that uh, this is not a image uh, application. Instead, it's actually runs on a, on a structured data. So there's actually a lot. Uh, we have uh, seen this is a <laughs> CVPR tutorial. Actually, focused a lot of my use cases on the image use cases. However, in reality, for the big data environment, there are actually a lot of use cases around the. Structured data, your transaction log, your your your, um, and also a lot a lot around the text data, and especially for those structured data, uh, for recommendations, for fraud detection, and so on, they are typically managed through uh, as I mentioned before, already managed using those uh, big data uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, for instance, you you are storing your data in a hive table, a uh, parquet table, and uh, you need to process it. I mean, it's it's. It's even more complex actually to to to, to process those data, structure data to generate those features, the, 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 the vector, the tensors you will need, uh, rather uh, compared to a image. So it, it's very difficult. It, it's it's usually involved a very complex end-to-end -end data processing pipelines and uh, running to 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 run it on a big data platform using those different uh, new different models or technologies. It turned out to be very efficient for people to develop the end-to-end -end pipeline. Okay. 
I think, uh, in summary, basically, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, efforts in the industry to try to make deep learning more accessible to the big data and data science community. Uh, there are several benefits, right? First of all, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of data, especially production data, already stored on a big data cluster, so it's much efficient. To, uh, it's much more efficient to analyze the data on the same cluster where the data is stored. And uh, a lot of those uh, production applications in a very complex end-to-end -end pipeline of workflows, and uh, it's much efficient to, in terms of, of development as well as deployment to try to integrate your deep learning model into those uh, big, big data pipeline or workflow. And uh, of course, it's for a lot of organizations, they have already set up a very large uh, big data cluster, hundreds of thousands of uh, servers, uh, and it's uh, m more cost effective, actually, to leverage those, uh, reuse those existing uh, clusters uh, to run those new deep learning applications. And those new applications are run, uh, basically will run with other workloads in a, in a dynamically shared fashion instead of a dedicated cluster. And, uh, well, we there are many different uh, uh, frameworks. I mean, Big DL, TensorFlow, and so on. You can um, Cafe, and so on. You can you can actually leverage that to on your big data cluster. And uh, we have provided Analytic Zoom, which is an open source project to try to provide a high level end to end index and the AI platform, and uh, make it easier to build and productionize your deep learning application for big data. You can directly use uh, Spark. Big deal, TensorFlow, as well as other models, and uh, to build out the end to end pipeline. So that's uh, basically what I have today. So, is there any questions? I have a very simple question. So, I'm not an expert for the Spark, and, and the first question is uh, and this is uh, my understanding. This is on the Spark. Uh, uh, framework with CPU computing, is mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the, the overall performance is uh, using this uh, distributed uh, uh, CPU computing, it is faster than the non uh, distributed GPU computing. Uh, well, it depends. I mean, there, there's, well, <laughs> there are different, the different ways how you look at it. First of all, on a single node performance, um, we have some, some, we have done some uh, testing, and it's actually what. It depends on uh, if it depends on which uh, skill you are using, right? what CPU and, and GPU. But uh, for even for model training, uh, we we actually see comparable performance uh, uh, with, with uh, K, I think a KAD, and uh, sometimes uh, um, yeah, I think it have similar performance to KAD or some newer with uh, I think with older generation of. Uh, well, let's put it this way. We have different <laughs> generation of CPUs and different generation of GPUs. So with some older generation of CPUs, um, I think one or two generation before, we actually see similar performance with KAD, sometimes K40, sometimes KAD. And with the latest uh, generation of uh, CPUs, I think we get about, uh, about a fraction of uh, um, P100, I think, uh, Sometimes it's thirty, sometimes fifty percent, sometimes eight, thirty percent. So, so it's on a single node training only performance. And for inference, we can actually get, get much higher because in inference there are a lot of uh, optimization you can apply in terms of, for instance, you can do a lot of quantization, int eight, and so on. This type of optimization. So that's a single node. And then yeah, you can use then you can use, utilize a cluster to do easier scale out. I mean, um, it's, it's, you can easily scale to hundreds or thousands uh, um, servers, which in which, which is not easy with a GPU cluster. And uh, so, but then the, the next question is that uh, if you look at performance, it's it's you sh I, I think you should not actually look at uh, model training or model inference only. You really look at the end-to-end -end performance, uh, as the example shows. In this case, we are comparing uh, 20, 
about twenty servers versus twenty k k forty GPU card. So it's a distributed GPU cast versus a distributed Xeon cast. Both are some old generation of servers, but uh, again, it's a distributed. Card. You can see it get about. A I think it's today. I think the reality is about four x speed up. If you look at end to end pipelines, because in reality, when you pr when, when you deploy the application in production, I mean it's, it's, it has many different components. And uh, looking at uh, one component is actually misleading because uh, other components can become, can become your bottleneck. So if you look at the end to end pipelines, uh, it, 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 yeah, in, in a lot of cases, it gives you benefits because uh, there are also a lot of processing in addition to the model only. Uh, does the big DL support uh, Intel graphics acceleration? Uh, not at this moment. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I'm aware of Intel has a, another project, uh, open source project called NGraph, which uh, provides a different type of acceleration um, based on the underlying hardware platform. This is something we plan to leverage so that we can provide acceleration to different type of accelerators. But today, Big DL runs on you know, Hadoop cluster, which is the primary Xeon-based uh, cluster. So that's what we have been focusing on. Uh, well, uh, does it Big DL support uh, Intel uh, Int eight uh, quantization now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I work with continuously streaming surveillance video. Mm -hmm. I wondered if uh, Analytics Zoo integrates nicely with Spark streaming, and if you have examples of that. Um, yeah, it it integrates with Spark streaming. I mean, it's a Spark job, so it's actually natively integrated with Spark streaming. And we also provide this integration with the Storm, Frink, and other stuff, Kafka, and other stuff. Um, we are working on, <laughs> I think we are, we are, we are working on a, some, some, some examples, but we, uh, we have been working with a customer uh, actually on a video, basically it's an IPTV, you get a video and then we try to recognize the images and doing some recommendations. So we're we working on that, but it's not available yet. <laughs>